leading you along the same paths I first traversed for my discrete math honors project last semester. Let's begin by getting introduced to the main characters of our story, which are the prime numbers. In order to be prime, you must meet three requirements. First, you have to be an integer, which is a whole number like negative one, zero, one, two, three, etc. Secondly, you have to be greater than one. So all of the negative numbers along with zero and one don't make the cut. Last but not least, you can't be a product of two smaller positive integers. As a consequence, the number 12, for example, could not be prime. 12 equals three times four, and that's a product of two smaller positive integers. What you might have noticed with these requirements is, while they make it clear what a prime number is not, they don't actually tell us that much about what prime numbers look like. Accordingly, it can be difficult to recognize a prime number. That's why a mathematician named Eratosthenes designed a process to help us identify primes. Using the sieve of Eratosthenes, you can find all the primes in an interval beginning with one and ending with some positive integer. We could use it to find all the primes between one and a hundred, or even one and a million. But given time constraints, I'll be showing you how it works for the interval beginning with one and ending with 30. We begin by listing all the integers in our interval. Then we cross out one. One is not greater than one, so it fills that requirement to be prime. We circle the closest number, two, and that's our first prime. Now we'll eliminate all the multiples of two because those numbers equal two times another number so they're a product of two smaller positive integers. We proceed forward, circling the closest uncrossed number, and once again, crossing out its multiples. The only new numbers removed are nine, 15, 21, and 27. So three isn't nearly as efficient as two. We go onward, circling five, and once again, eliminating its multiples. This time, the only fresh removal was 25. And now we're done. Every multiple of seven, which is the next prime number, has already been taken out by two, three, or five. So we can simply circle the remaining numbers and we've found our prime. As we were going through this process, each prime number removed significantly fewer numbers than the preceding prime. Two took out 14 numbers, while three only crossed out four new numbers, and five took out just one. This is an important pattern because the rate of removal in Eratosthenes' sieve is what is determining the density of prime numbers. In order to better understand that important pattern, we ask the following questions. First, how many numbers are removed at each step of the algorithm? And second, exactly how many are left behind after each step's completion? To analyze these questions, we'll need some mathematical language. First, when we want to refer to a prime number, we'll do so based on its position in the overall list of prime numbers, ordered from smallest to largest. The number five, for example, would be denoted as P3, since it's the third prime number. 
And if we wanted to talk about the 100th prime number, we could do so using P100. In addition, when we want to talk about the product of the first R primes, where R is just some positive integer we choose, we'll do so using this notation, which looks kind of like the side view of a table. Here, the number at the bottom tells us where to start pulling primes from the list, while the number at the top of the table tells us where to stop pulling our primes. For example, if we had one on the bottom and five on the top, that would mean we pull P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5 from our list, multiply them together, and we have the number we're talking about. With that notation squared away, we can now set up the interval we'll be working with in our calculations. We choose to specifically work with the interval that begins with one and ends with the product of the first R primes. For once again, R is just some positive integer we choose. We could have it be one, two, three, or even a hundred. It's up to us. Now we can get into the fun of actually calculating our, our results. We use approaches from number theory and probability theory, which are two fascinating branches of mathematics. Number theory analyzes integers and their properties, while probability theory looks at the likelihood of events occurring. Using those methods, we calculate the, like, these formulas for any positive integer k that is less than or equal to r. If, for example, our r was 7, that would mean we were looking at the interval from 1 to the product of the first 7 primes. And we could analyze the amount removing, at the amount removed and the amount remaining for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh steps of the algorithm. <coughs> To see these results in action, let's consider the case where r equals 7 and k equals 7. Plugging those values into our first formula, we find that the number of integers removed by the 7th prime in the interval from 1 to the product of the first 7 primes is 5,759. While that may seem like a large number, it's actually only about 1% of the overall amount of integers in our interval. So by the time we're getting to the seventh prime, the efficiency of prime removal has significantly decreased, just like our formula predicted. If we plug those same values into our second result, we find that the number of integers left behind by that seventh prime is 92,000. 167, which is about 18% of the amount of integers in our interval. Those numbers that are left behind have some interesting properties that we can analyze. First, when we want to refer to those numbers that survive the first k removals for some positive integer k less than or equal to r, we'll use the name potentially prime numbers since these numbers, unlike the ones that are already crossed out, actually have the potential to be prime. When we look at these numbers, specifically in the interval beginning with the product of the first k primes and ending with the product of the first k plus one primes, we find that all these numbers fit one of three possible points. The first option for a potentially prime number is being the product of the first k primes plus one. Additionally, a potentially prime number could be the product of the first k primes plus some prime number bigger than all the primes in the product. Finally, a potentially prime number could be the product of the first k primes plus some composite number not divisible by any of those first k primes. Here, a composite number is just some number that is a product of two smaller positive integers. So six is an example of a composite number since six is two times three, the product of two smaller positive integers. 
since these numbers survive the first K removals, you'd expect them to be more likely to be prime than some random number. But exactly how likely is it that one of these numbers will be prime? Using the prime number theorem, coupled with that second formula we derived, we find that the probability of potentially prime number is indeed prime is given by this formula. In other words, if we took all the potentially prime numbers in our interval, wrote them on little slips of paper, and put them in that nice big bowl, that fraction is telling us how likely it is that we'll draw out a prime number. If we evaluate that formula for k equals 4, we find that there is about a 54% chance of being prime for potentially prime numbers between the product of the first four primes and the product of the first five primes. That's significantly higher than the likelihood for an arbitrary number in that same interval, which is only between 13% and 19%. Something else that is interesting about potentially prime numbers is that they encompass all the prime numbers. In other words, Every prime number is also a potentially prime number. So we can categorize them according to those three forms we identified earlier for potentially prime numbers. The first category of prime numbers, Euclidean primes, are well known in the field of number theory. This form of number was first used by Euclid in his proof that there are infinitely many primes and that's where they get their name. An open question in mathematics about these numbers is, are there infinitely many Euclidean primes? The second category is one that we introduce for the first time. We define primitive numbers to be those primes that are the product of the first k primes, plus some prime number larger than all the primes in the product. Our final category is another new one that we contribute. We designate partially primitive numbers to be the primes that are the product of the first k primes, plus some composite number that isn't divisible by any of the first k primes. Having classified all the primes, we can now broaden the original question of whether or not there are infinitely many Euclidean primes. Now we can ask, are there infinitely many primes of each of the three types? Using Bertrand's postulate, which is a famous result in number theory, we find that there is at least one primitive number or one partially primitive number in each of our specified intervals. This guarantees that there are infinitely many primitive numbers or infinitely many partially primitive numbers. So our original question of whether or not there are infinitely many primes of each of the three types has yet to be fully answered. However, we did make some advancements, and the fact that it's still an open question reveals part of why math is so beautiful. For every result we obtain, there are a hundred questions we can ask and explore. For math has infinite beauty. These are my references, and thanks for watching.